Good morning. Can I request uh, the chairpersons to please take the dais? Yeah. We'll manage. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Probal Neogi. It is uh, my great uh, privilege to welcome Dr. Beth Dupree onto the stage, a highly distinguished breast surgeon from Arizona. Please, welcome. Nothing gives me more pleasure than to introduce a dear friend of 17 years standing, Dr. Beth Dupree, who is yesterday was conferred the Honorary Fellowship of the Association of Surgeons of India. She is currently serving as the Chief Medical Officer of Inner Still Health Caliber Medical Gateway Sciences in Arizona. She is board certified in general surgery and has extensive experience in the management of breast cancer. She is a passionate advocate for promoting true healing of the body, mind and soul because as we are all aware, cancer doesn't just affect the body, it affects the body, mind and soul and these shared interests of managing a cancer patient has strengthened our relationship over the past several years. She is a graduate from the University of Philadelphia and she has undergraduate degrees in behavioral neuroscience and the history and philosophy of science from the University of Pittsburgh. She has completed general surgery residency at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia and has served as an adjunct assistant professor the University of Pennsylvania. She has several qualifications to her credit including a certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. So it is my great honor and privilege in requesting Dr. Beth Dupree to deliver her guest lecture and I request Dr. Probal Niyogi to do the honors. Thank you. It is truly an honor and privilege to be at ASACON 2020, uh, to be back with fellow surgeons and colleagues since the wave of COVID has disrupted uh, our world of, of getting together with our colleagues to become educated. Um, I want to thank Dr. Raghu Ram for the invitation um, to come to India, not just this time, but in 2016, where I was privileged to train Indian surgeons on techniques for nipple sparing mastectomy and also intraoperative ultrasound. And today I want to also thank Perimeter Medical for entrusting me with the very beginning aspects of research in this um, field of intraoperative margin assessment. I come to you from Arizona. Um, it is an absolutely beautiful place. So if you ever get to the United States, Sedona, Arizona is magnificent. And our amazing dark skies, and we are a dark sky city, provides you with the opportunity to see the universe in a way that many of you may never have seen due to the amount of light in the cities, particularly ones that I have visited while in India. Obtaining negative surgical margins is an important part of breast conserving surgery. I've, I've been in practice for 35 years as a general surgeon and over the last 20 years focused my practice on diseases of the breast. 
due to our ability to identify cancers through screening in the United States, we are able to identify cancers at an earlier stage where breast conserving surgery has really become the mainstay of how we try to treat our patients. Unfortunately, for many of us, despite having the highest technologies in ultrasound, MRI, and mammography, we still wait for the pathologist's report, as we call them our Monday morning quarterbacks. They give us the answer days after the surgery to know whether or not our margins are clear. And unfortunately for our patients, when margins are not clear, they've gone through surgery, they're waiting for that phone call to let them know that they're okay. And in 20 to 25% of patients, we have to call them and tell them that unfortunately, their margins are positive and they need an, another operation. This leads certainly to increased costs, decreased cosmetic outcomes, poor patient satisfaction, um, increased complications, and one of the barriers to adopting technologies to really help us intraoperatively is that surgeons are still compensated for that second surgery to take someone back to the operating room. So what we are trying to do is look at intraoperative margin assessment and how we can utilize novel technologies to improve our care. The full impact of the re-excision problem doesn't even just come from increased complications and patient experience. Many patients, when they receive a phone call that a margin was positive, they don't even want to entertain the thought of another lumpectomy, and many times will choose and convert right to mastectomy, which that way, we, we don't know if there's going to be additional disease at the margins when we go back. We're just basing our care on what we know from the pathology report. Another aspect of this process is loss of income for an individual, for their loved one that came to bring them to the hospital, child care, other aspects of, of, the, of someone's life that could definitely impact them. An additional $16,000 for reoperation, increased complication rate, not to mention the psychosocial emotional trauma that a woman can go through if her margins are positive. There was a study done looking at re-excision after breast conserving surgery and the impact on cost and the impact on time in the operating room and healthcare. This was a single institution and this came from the Annals of Surgical Oncology just done in 2020. What they looked at was a perspective between um, breast conserving surgery and those that required re-excision was 18.5%. Those re-excisions were most likely due to ductal carcinoma in situ, which we know may not show up on a, on a mammography unless there are microcalcifications present. In this study, the re-excision after breast conserving surgery represented 39% of the direct operating room cost for that patient and 14% of time in the operating room. So the time and the money that is actually spent um, on those second operations is something that getting a handle on intraoperative margin at the initial surgery is intended to do. Surgeons can also play a factor in this process. They looked at a study with 55 experienced sur surgeons, some that did shaves on all six margins and, those, and 45 that did shaves on no margins. And their re-excision rate over a five-year period varied from 7.8 to 36%. The ones that did six additional shaves had a lower intraoperative, um, they had a lower re-excision rate, but there's an increased cost with each re-excision. So from an economic perspective, when you look at a randomized control trial looking at taking six shave margins on every single case, First of all, those six shave margins are going to impact the cosmesis of that breast. We also know that we have an extra $400 per case for pathology to look at those six margins. Um, and the re-excision procedures had higher financial costs to the patient with time off work. Um, there's also the emotional burden 
And in this particular study, they did not even address the cosmesis for the patient. What do we currently have to use intraoperatively to help us with this assessment? There are two-dimensional and three-dimensional opportunities to visualize a lumpectomy specimen in the operating room. At the end of the day, again, the pathologist is the Monday morning quarterback where you can do an excision and still end up with margins that may or may not be um, negative based on what we know in a two-dimensional limitation. We cannot see in all of the dimensions of a lumpectomy for which there are six margins we need to look at. So specimen radiograph is not the answer to decreasing re-excision rates. I had the opportunity to use a novel technology that it was, it was a wonderful toy, um, it gave me a beautiful image, but it did not give me any information about the margins. And so it was another piece of equipment that I did not feel was going to enhance my patient's care, but I was able to try it, to look at it, to see if it had that potential. There's currently one FDA cleared uh, margin assessment uh, device that looks at electromagnetic field changes. Margin probe has been around since 2013. It has a sensitivity that, and specificity that are low, and it was really found to be no better than standard procedures than what we already use. It, it did not significantly reduce the re-excision rates in breast conserving surgery, and it's very hard for me to promote a technology that's not going to change um, the end game, which is decreasing re-excisions. There's an investigational technology that looks at bioimpedance spectroscopy. ClearEdge is investigational. It has not received um, FDA clearance yet, so stay tuned. Lumacil is another one that uses an oncofluorescent agent where the patient gets injected, comes back to surgery the next day, and a scanner is used to look at the cavity. One of the issues that I believe is going to come up with Lumacil is that in the intraoperative space, when you can see um, an area of immunofluorescence, you still don't know that you have a two millimeter negative margin, which is what we use as our standard margin needed for ductal carcinoma in situ to be able to know that we have done the appropriate surgical procedure. I had the opportunity to try the uh, Reams eye knife, which again is investigational. It's been used in the UK looking at mass spectrometry, and it's a, it's a wonderful technology, but it's not ready for prime time yet, and is still in the emerging phase. One of the reasons that I came to India in 2016 is I believe that the use of ultrasound intraoperatively by surgeons is so underutilized globally. In the United States, I still have to fight to get surgeons to get trained in intraoperative art ultrasound because ultrasound gives us direct, real-time access to where a clip that has been placed from a surgical biopsy can be identified. It's cost-effective, it has a low learning curve. I was able to avoid needle localizations in about 96% of my breast-conserving surgeries by having the intraoperative skills myself as a surgeon. And I believe that this is a technology that could be very widely and easily adopted in India to help with patients getting to obtain negative margins. In the current treatment, less than 17% of surgeons use ultrasound globally. In some areas, it is a battle between radiology and surgery, but I believe as surgeons, we all have a very, very um, highly developed right brain. We understand three-dimensional anatomy of the breast and I really encourage breast ultrasound to be a technology that is added to the armamentarium of every breast surgeon. In 2021, I had the great honor to work with Perimeter OCT, or Optical Coherence Tomography. It is a high resolution technology that captures an image immediately there's no destruction to tissue, so there's no frozen section or losing of the tissue. There's no injectable component, and it very easily fit into the workflow. 
And uh, you can imagine how difficult it was during COVID to be able to do clinical trials. So I felt very fortunate to be able to bring this technology into my health system and begin the process of determining how effective this optical coherence tomography could be. Currently, there is an OCT technology that is available and being used in multiple centers of excellence in breast cancer care in the United States. It takes an image 10 times the resolution of an x-ray or ultrasound. It allows us to visualize a margin even more clearly and um, be able to look at the entire specimen and not just subsections like the pathologists do. When our pathologists are evaluating our margins um, after the fact, they're looking at small subsets of tissue from each margin and what we're able to look at is the entire surface. Currently in clinical trials in over nine centers of excellence in the United States, um, the OCT is being used in the next generation, the pivotal trial, to see how artificial intelligence can aid the surgeon in identifying areas of abnormality. One, one reason why I love this technology is although we are just beginning to use this on a daily basis in breast cancer care, it can translate into dermatologic cancers, into gastrointestinal cancers. Any solid tumor will be able to be imaged and visualized on this OCT technology. And when the artificial intelligence and the other tissues are all added together, we may be able as surgeons to have direct real-time feedback in the operating room for multiple cancers and multiple tumors like I have currently in breast cancer surgery for breast lumpectomy. So I need to explain to you how it works. If you look under the, under the microscope anywhere from two to seven days, you can see that duct which is filled with ductal carcinoma in situ. The image below was real time obtained in the operating room in less than 15 seconds that allowed me to see that duct that was clearly filled with ductal carcinoma in situ and know that my margin was still positive and needed a wider excision. So OCT works on basic, the basic principles of ultrasound. Instead of using sound waves to generate the image, OCT uses light instead of sound. So we learn how certain things are reflective, like calcifications. We learn how things are transmitted through, like adipose tissue and cysts. And then we can also see that there's some scattering and dense tissue. But OCT, as opposed to all of the other intraoperative margin assessment tools, is not impacted by dense breast tissue. We know that 40, 40 to 60 percent of women have enough density in their breasts that make it difficult to identify abnormalities on mammography. So being able to look at this high resolution and dense tissue allows me to see down to two millimeters, which is our society's guidelines for negative margins for DCIS. This is an image of a nail bed. Imagine a nail bed on the top slide. You can see that the ultrasound gives us a hazy, um, very, very difficult to visualize nail root. On the inferior image on the ultrasound, is this a pointer? Okay, thank you. Oh, there it is. <gasps> Look at that, the top one, okay. I like the technology. Um, the nail root is not nearly as easily visualized on the superior portion of, um, is, is, is more visualized. The, the, the top image is actually the ultrasound. I, I flipped them this morning by accident when I was rearranging my slides. On the ultrasound image, it's very, very hazy and um, you cannot actually see the same definition. This one of the kind technology um, allows us to identify calcifications at a margin, to visualize small ducts filled with DCIS, to discern them from blood vessels, to discern them from cysts, and has a high resolution, much higher res resolution than specimen x-ray. 
People have asked if we could eliminate specimen x-ray, but we still need the x-ray to be able to identify the presence of um, the surgical clips from the biopsy. Intraoperative OCT images, you can compare directly to pathology, where the adipose tissue, you can see all of the small areas of fat noted within the tissue. You can clearly see the apocrine metaplasia while you're in the operating room that normally you would have to wait seven days to see. You can see these undulating irregular margins of invasive ductal carcinoma. And ductal carcinoma has a very pathognomonic visualization of the ducts filled with disease. So when we look at what our atlas has in the future, being able to potentially look at adrenal glands, the cervix, the colon, the liver, kidney, pancreas, spleen, thyroid, tongue. This technology, I believe, is just in its infancy. And what we will see over the next few years is the addition of other uh, cancers on our list of what we are planning to use in the future. Currently, it's very easy for us to see invasive ductal cancers on mammographies. So most of the focus is on ductal carcinoma in site two and breast care because it's those margins that are bringing us back. We also are using a novel technology called Prelude DX to look at ductal carcinoma in site two from a genomic standpoint. And in those patients that have a low risk tumor, they can safely avoid radiation therapy making our surgical procedure and our two millimeter margins that much more important in those patients that will not receive radiation therapy. Our workflow goes from the lumpectomy to the specimen radiograph to the OCT. And we, directed, we do directed shaves if an area is positive. And then postoperatively, we, we get to confirm our results. So in this patient, you can see there is a duct that is coming through as I scroll through the image. And that duct, this entire image is two millimeters. So I know that that duct filled with ductal carcinoma in situ is too close to the margin and needs a re-excision. I'm going to present a case to you to show how effective this was in this patient's management. 71-year-old woman had a small area of microcalcifications about eight, six to eight centimeters from the nipple. Her MRI showed a very large area of enhancement. She had a Prelude DX, which was very low risk. So with this DCIS, if we could obtain negative margins, she could avoid radiation therapy. She had grade three ptosis. So if she were having a mastectomy, she would not have been a candidate for nipple sparing mastectomy. And the discussion that I had with this patient was that to do a reduction pattern lumpectomy, even if we'd be unable to obtain negative margins, she would then be able to go forward at a later date and do a nipple sparing mastectomy. So her mammogram clearly shows just this small area of microcalcifications seen in both areas. Her MRI showed a, a much larger area of enhancement which measured seven to eight millimeters, seven to eight centimeters, excuse me. I had my, I had my breast imager do RFID localizations and the calcifications were clearly identified and the one margin, my calcifications were too close for my comfort based on the specimen x-ray. So I took an additional shave margin right away. So it did not change my normal surgical flow just because I was using OCT. On the true and the medial lumpectomy margin, you can see the patient had DCIS that within one millimeter. She had 116 grams of tissue removed. It was a very, very large lumpectomy. On the medial shave margin where the calcifications were, the patient had additional DCIS that was easily visible. And I was, when I did this patient on trial, it was before we had the artificial intelligence, but the artificial intelligence shows you that I picked the right areas because my areas were chosen in the red and the AI was in the blue after the fact. On the final margin that I excised, I was still able to see DCIS. So I had taken two additional margins. And at this point, my plastic surgeon stopped me 
and said, you can't take any more tissue or the patient's nipple pedicle is going to die because we had planned the surgery together. This is the patient pre-operative on the left. She can see she had significant grade three ptosis. Her post-op reduction was um, an excellent cosmetic result. Her lumpectomy though, continued to have an additional 4.5 centimeters of tumor and every single margin that I excised where I continued to see DCIS at the margin was proven on the final pathology meet to consistent with what I saw on the OCT. 12 weeks later, she went back for a nipple sparing mastectomy, found an additional four centimeters of cancer. So although the patient couldn't have a lumpectomy, had I not done the OCT intraoperatively, I would have potentially taken this patient back for another attempt at a lumpectomy, but I knew that I could take no more tissue. So her pre-op x-ray, her pre-op um, photos from prior to her nipple sparing mastectomy, this is her post nipple sparing mastectomy after implant. She was very happy with her cosmetic results and she ended up um, knowing after the first surgery that I did not believe that I had obtained negative margin, so I was able to give her that peace of mind. In another case, I had a patient with a posterior lumpectomy margin where I clearly saw evidence of an abnormal duct. On re-excision, I, I also saw a superior margin that I was highly concerned at DCIS. And it was something that um, I, I, I make notes to the, to the engineers that are reading my studies afterwards, but it was pretty obvious that this patient still had DCIS and it was exactly 0.5 millimeters. And because we're imaging all six planes, my superior and posterior margin was an overlap and I was able to see that abnormal duct in both images. So when you think about what we see as surgeons in the operating room, by placing the um, specimen on the OCT technology, we're able to image the entire specimen. So in my, in my first 20 patients, um, I, did, I had a 13% re-excision rate prior to using this technology. I had just done my data for the NAPBC. And in these patients, it took me 14 extra minutes in the operating room. It was 25 minutes from out of the patient to formalin. 20% of those margins on the original lumpectomy specimen still had DCIS, so had I not been using this technology, I would not have been able to decrease the re-excision rate. And, this, and these are on the first 20 patients that were ever done in breast cancer surgery in the world with this technology. I was able to get the re-excision rate down to 5%, and my DC, I had one single duct of DCIS that showed up on my final pathology that was unable to be seen. This article was published um, in the Indian Journal of Surgery in July of 2021 um, to look at our wild field optical coherence tomography um, as an emerging technology in cancer care. The pivotal trial is ongoing right now at these nine centers of excellence um, in the United States. She, the um, results are expected to be done sometime in the next 12 months and 333 patients will participate. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and present this data and this emerging technology, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, and I like the last statement on your slide, be the change you wish to see in the world. And I found many qualities in you that make you more Indian than many Indians here. Thank you. So, um, any questions uh, from the floor, please uh, identify yourself and uh, do ask. Yes. Madam, my question is, by adding uh, OCT in your surgery, you add uh, pathologist and radiologist as a team in a surgery. Because the cell diagnosis the surgeon don't know and the X-ray reading also the surgeon don't know. So both the things require the reading of the OCT. So my question is, 
do your surgical team another pathologist or radiologist be hired or the surgeon has to be trained in pathology or radiology what he wants to know is that whether you would involve a pathologist and a radiologist to your team rather than do it yourself as a surgeon with this particular technology i my pathologist and i work very very closely together he was actually on the clinical trial with me um in with radiology the radiologist really had no interest at all in being involved with this because it is a real time read in the operating room um and at this point there'd be no compensation for them and as surgeons doing intraoperative ultrasound this to me is just another step further into being able to give our patients the best and highest quality of care while we're in the operating theater with them under anesthesia hoping to prevent their return to the operating room the the real answer in reading these images coming down in the future is going to be the artificial intelligence which is going to be a second read for us to be able to help us to be as precise as possible but with the current technology being read by surgeons it's highly effective thank you uh, ben, uh, i have a question for you thank you for a very enlightening lecture on uh, octs and uh, my question i have a couple of questions in fact what is the false positive rate of oct and does it increase the aggressiveness of the surgery when you go ahead have you studied that that's one and number two does oct also help in lymph node mapping in what lymph node mapping lymphatic mapping um there's no role for oct in lymphatic mapping and the false positive rate is something that we're looking at in the pivotal trial. I I did an additional 68 patients and um probably in only two cases out of 68 uh um, did it was thought it was a false positive. We thought it was a false positive at the time, but then the final pathology in the reexcision so the pathologist read the margins both those margins as negative. I took additional tissue based on what I saw. and both of those additional shapes had cancer so clearly i was seeing what the pathologist wasn't seeing in their random sections so that's something that we are diving very deeply in in the pivotal trial now because we're seeing the entire surface of the of the lumpectomy cavity of the lumpectomy specimen and the pathologist is only seeing random areas that they look at so um acting on what we see in the operating room i uh, i don't believe is ever going to be um an issue of taking too much tissue because if the alternative was taking six shave margins and we're directly taking only one or two margins based on what we see um I don't even think a false positive rate is going to be a big issue with this but what I found in my personal practice was that I could see more in the operating room than the pathologist was able to see on the final pathology in two cases Thank you madam for a excellent lecture on OCT Thank you. Thank you. I now request the chair persons to felicitate uh, Dr. Ben Dupri. For the next guest lecture, I would like to invite uh, Professor Michael Benjamin Eddy, and to chair the session, I would like to invite on stage Dr. Abhay Darvi, Dr. Ajay Bandarwar, Dr. Ramakant, Dr. Vijay Kumar Singh, and Dr. Dilip Rajpal. 